first, I would like to uh, thank uh, Arnaldo for the invitation. This is my first time at Kernel Recipes. I'm afraid this is not going to be quite as deeply technical as the previous two presentations, but I hope you find it interesting. I work at uh, the CERN IT Storage and Data Man Management Group uh, since two years. And CERN is a very heavy user of the Fuse uh, subsystem. And I'll just give an overview um, of um, how we use it uh, to serve the data to our users. So the, the group, so I need to also make a disclaimer here because the projects that I'm going to talk about, they have been uh, in existence for well over a decade, all of them, before I even joined the group. So what I'm presenting here is mostly the work of my colleagues and not just mine. Um, okay, so the group is divided in three sections. Um, we have the physics data section, which is the section that takes data from the experiments, which I'm part of. We have also a general storage section that serves data for users, for virtual machines and so on. And there is also a tape and backup section that uh, takes data from disk into tape. So a quick introduction because this is a different community than what I'm used to presenting to. What is CERN? What, what is it that we do? So CERN is an international uh, intergovernmental organization that does basic research in uh, nuclear and particle physics. And it consists of 24 member states and another 10 associate member states. And it's located at the border between Switzerland and France, which is this line uh, in orange here. It's not very easy to see. And um, CERN's mission is to gain understanding of the most fundamental particles and the laws of nature. So, for this, we need three big, there are three big pillars. So the first one is we need to get the particles going very fast to collide, so the accelerators. Uh, then you have to have something that detects what happens, and then you have to save it to disk and process later. So you have the accelerators, detectors, and computing. I'll give a quick introduction of each of the parts. So the accelerator is the Large Hadron Collider. It is about 27 kilometers uh, in circumference. So here you have a picture of uh, where it's situated. CERN's campus is, uh, uh, the main campus is around here. So near the Atlas detector. Then um, the control center and some other experiments are around here. And you can see here the, the airport, just for a scale to give an idea. And behind you have you know, the beautiful Alps near Geneva. Um, uh, so the particles, they go very close to the speed of light. They go m more than 11,000 times per second through the, the accelerator. Um, and of course, that um, it cannot just get the particles to the speed of light in one go. So actually, there is a, a, a complex system of uh, various accelerators. So it starts in the LINAC, and then it goes through the proton synchrotron, then it goes to the booster, then the, the SPS, and then from there, the particles are injected into the main ring, where you have uh, the, the four uh, big experiments, uh, ATLAS, CMS, ALICE, and LHCB, and uh, around the lower, uh, lower energy accelerators, you also have all sorts of kind of experiments, and you, only, you don't only have accelerators, there are also decelerators. Because to study antimatter, for example, there are a couple of stages that accelerate the, the protons, then you create antiprotons, and then you have to decelerate them and trap them to, so that they can be studied. So this AD here is the antiproton decelerator. All right, so uh, what are these uh, detectors? So they're kind of like a big 3D camera. They're very, very big, very heavy. And they measure the position, the charge of the particles, and the momentum, what direction they're going. And they do this at about 40 million times per second. So the, the, these particles that are going 11,000 times per second, there are 1,200 or so bunches of them. And when these bunches cross, there are collisions. You can have more than one at a time. And the detector captures uh, what goes on. So every 25 nanoseconds, there is a collision, and the detector um, 
the text stamp. So, uh, and, and these are very complex, large machines that have been built by international collaborations spanning most of the globe. Uh, so here I have a picture of the four main experiments. The big one on the top left is Atlas. Uh, actually, these are two people standing here, so you can have an idea of the scale. Same for CMS. So CMS is called the compact muon solenoid. It's much smaller than Atlas, but it's still quite big. So, and, and this is Alice. Um, so you notice that the two uh, detectors on the left, they're symmetrical, they're more general. They study all sorts of uh, phenomena. LHCB and ALICE, uh, they're a bit different, they're asymmetric. So LHCB is the LHC beauty experiment. It's uh, used to study uh, exotic particles that have a beauty quark as part of their uh, one of their constituents. So what they do is they have this uh, very, very strong magnetic field and they study what goes mostly forward in, in the direction of the, the beams. And the magnetic field is used to spread more the particles so that they can see better what's coming out. Alice actually is uh, asymmetric for a different reason. Alice is a, uh, an experiment to study heavy ion collisions. And sometimes you collide also protons with lead atoms. And the lead is much, much heavier. And this part here is the muon spectrometer. Uh, so because the, the, the uh, most particles are going forward, you put it on uh, one side of the detector only. Uh, what is happening inside? So how do the particles interact? So this is a slice through CMS, and at the center you have this uh, silicon tracker, the, just uh, like the chips that you have in your camera, perhaps similar to that. And when the particle goes through, there's a little bit of ionization that creates a charge, this charge is collected, and the usually proportional to, to the energy, depending on the kind of material you're using. So this is used to give the position wh where the particle is going. And of course, the, the different kinds of particles, uh, they interact differently. And that's why you need this giant detector. Um, so the photons, they traverse the tracker and they stop at this uh, layer called the electromagnetic calorimeter. Um, then uh, protons, neutrons, and other kind of uh, hadrons they go through the electromagnetic colorimeter because they're heavier and they end up in the hadron colorimeter. Uh, so here they create all sorts of nuclear reactions, interactions and so on. And the collection of the charge gives you the total energy. And then with a magnetic field, which is uh, created by the superconducting uh, solenoid, the charged particles, they bend the trajectory. So uh, charged particles, like positive charged particles go in one direction, negative going the other direction. And uh, these big uh, detectors here, they're filled with gas, uh, usually argon gas. And they're there because muon is uh, very uh, difficult to detect. So they're like a heavy cousin of the electron. So the electron is um, 500 keV in mass. The muon is about 100 uh, MeV. And because of that, it penetrates uh, through matter very easily. And the combination of, so it goes through the detector and goes away, just like neutrinos, they just don't leave any interaction in the detector. And from the curve, uh, the radius of the curvature and which side where it passes in the muon spectrometer, you can review the energy and the direction where, where the new muon went. And of course, you have a lot of things happening inside this detector, and this generates a lot of data. So to give an example, I took here a page out of this uh, technical design report for the CMS detector. We're currently on the phase one, uh, where we don't have a lot of pileup, but after the current run is over, we will go into phase two, and then the number of collisions that happen to, uh, at, in one go inside the detector will go up by quite a bit. And you can see here that the expected rates at the uh, second part of phase two is to reach about 51 terabits per second of data coming out of the detector. And it's very difficult to save that to disk. So this is uh, about 380 terabytes every minute. So how, how does the data get from the detector uh, to disk and then tape? Uh, here is a setup of ALICE. It's one of the newer instances of EOS, 
which I will talk about later. So the detector itself produces to about 28 terabits of data and this is uh, already reduced by the level one trigger uh, to something uh, more manageable, five terabits per second. Then you have a, a, a lot of uh, nodes and GPUs processing this in memory and choosing uh, which events are interesting to be saved to disk because of course uh, the, the case that we want to study, they're very rare. Most of the interactions that happen, they're just uh, scattering. It's like you have two billiard balls, they hit each other, they go in another direction, but they don't break, they don't make anything interesting. We want to study the things that are very different than just uh, scattering. So it, 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 this part is in the experimental area uh, near the detector. So there, there is a fallback uh, buffer in case there is a problem with this connection. So the, the system is capable of sending uh, more than this, but in general it will send about 280 gigabytes per second from, the, uh, from this part at the detector site into EOS. And here we have a distributed file system uh, that holds 150 petabytes of usable data. And what happens is that during the year, the experiment will take data, it will go into this um, the system, and then later on, they will send some to the tape, uh, the EOS instance that is in front of the tape archive, and then it flows to tape and uh, is stored for later processing. At the same time, people are submitting batch jobs uh, to do physics analysis or reconstruction, of, of what happened inside the detector to create secondary data sets that actually the physicists use. And this is where Fuse is involved. So in this part here where uh, you're just reading data from this distributed file system into your physics analysis and, and processing data. Um, in terms of hardware, this is what it looks like. So this is called the Alice O2 installation. And uh, it has 180 uh, petabytes of uh, raw space and it's using an erasure code, a 10, point, 10 plus 2 layout, so you have 150 terabytes of used space. And this is to allow to write to more disks or read from more disks, so it gives better performance than using a, like a two-replica layout, which is common for the other experiments. So the system has about 12,000 uh, hard disks in total. The picture here shows you about a third of the system, and on the other side I show what the, one of the file server looks like. So each of them has 96 uh, disks in a couple of JBODs and the disks are about 18 terabytes uh, of space and this is all connected with 100 gig networking. Uh, last year, in the beginning of this year, there were some measurements made uh, that reached uh, with testing, like with 1100 uh, writing streams, uh, could write 380 gigabytes per second and uh, there were tests also do, done with the clients in the same network, reading many, many files at the same time, reaching about 1.3 uh, terabytes per second. So, uh, these are the, so for this year, during the proton-proton run, um, I looked in our monitoring to see like what are the peak rates. As you can see here, so this is the last two weeks of data taking. Actually, I took this screenshot last week, so it's last week, but uh, from, from last week. And uh, the averages, uh, they're uh, smaller, but because you have these sustained uh, peaks of uh, activity, so you have several hours of data taking at the, near the peak, the system needs to be able to handle this. So, and then um, after the data is on EOS, the, we have about uh, five tape libraries with 180 uh, drives and, and this allows us to send uh, between 15 and 60 gigabytes uh, per second to tape. Uh, uh, so this is uh, showing the last couple of years of uh, data going to tape. So we breached the record here uh, a few months ago uh, I actually cleaned up the graph a bit and uh, we, we did a bit more than uh, 45 petabytes of data. And when I initially suggested the title of this talk, I was thinking about this article that came out last year, which says uh, that, okay, we reached the uh, next byte of uh, disk capacity installed at CERN. Um, 
so here you have the progression over the years. Things are increasing very fast. And uh, in 2020, 30 and later, when we go into the high luminosity phase two part of the LHC, these uh, data rates are going to increase uh, a lot. EOS, um, so just to give an idea, we want to make sure that we have a cheap system and uh, EOS allows to mix the different generations of hardware. Uh, so this is a plot of the disk capacity. We're mostly out of the one and two terabyte uh, disks, but there's still a lot of uh, six terabyte disk remaining. And this is actually not bad because uh, even though the disks are increasing a lot in capacity, the write speed that you can write to it is not changing very much. So when you have uh, the high luminosity LHC, if we go everything into 18 terabyte disks, we will not have enough performance in terms of number of streams that you can write to be able to satisfy the data um, speeds that the detectors need. Um, so then I looked in our monitoring and uh, this is the real exabyte that should be the uh, part of the title of the, the, the presentation. So um, over last year, there, there was more than one, roughly one exabyte read via Fuse from EOS system. This is combining all the, the 24 instances that, that we have. Um, so, and this makes up about 18% of all the data read. And in terms of traffic, so if you, the way Fuse is used, uh, it's, uh, there is a, the batch system next to, to EOS and people submit jobs to this batch system and it's very convenient for them to have their files uh, accessible just as any other uh, POSIX file system. So the, the, the authentication goes via Kerberos, the ticket is spread over the batch system and then their jobs can just read the file using a path. And as you can see here, the, the, the peak from, from the batch system reached almost uh, 300 gigabytes per second. So this is since the beginning of this year. And you can see that the, roughly the, the 450 gigabytes per second of read uh, speeds. Um, if you look in terms of number of files, instead of data uh, moving around, then you see how important Fuse is because Fuse is not only used for just reading data for analysis, uh, although it is used for that. Uh, a lot of people have uh, uh, used Fuse for writing. So the users, every user at CERN has a terabyte of space and then they can save on this space their secondary data sets, their thesis, their code, they do compiling, even though it's not very advised to do compiling on this system. So because they have the space, they use it this way. And that's why you have, in terms of number of files, Fuse is very, very significant. However, uh, overall, still there is a lot of uh, data that is going via something else. So you must be asking maybe yourself, what is this X3D thing? And this is what I work on. So I'm a maintainer of X3D. Um, so this is a project for a system for scalable uh, cluster data access for remote data access and it was initially developed for the Babar experiment at Slack in Stanford um, and I linked here this uh, next generation root file server that's where the root comes from root is the data analysis software that is used by physicists um, and it was started by Andy Hanushevsky, Avisa Dorigo and Fabrizio Furano. Fabrizio is still in the group and Andy still uh, works directly in the project. So he's there more to steer the ship in the right direction. Um, and I'm more handling like uh, reviewing of uh, requests and uh, infrastructure side of things. Uh, the project is written in C++, it's open source, uh, LGPL. It is available in most distributions actually. Uh, you can think of it as something similar to curl and nginx and varnish together or squid. If you, if you will, um, it supports its own protocol. Um, so this is because it has the client, the server, and it can act as a cache all in one project. Uh, it, it has its own protocol that is stateful and is quite POSIX-like. This is the table that I put on the right here, and I highlighted two very special operations for us, which is support for vector reads and writes over the network. Um, it supports TLS 
since version 5 and I joined the project around release 5.5, we're at 5.7 now. Um, so the, the, the server can be configured as a proxy or caching server and authentication, there are me several methods that we use. Kerberos is the most common for uh, users. On the grid, uh, certificates are more common, but there is a push towards uh, using tokens in the future. And shared secret is more for like the internal communication of the cluster. Um, I should say though that uh, XRD is not a file system and it's not just for file systems. What it does is takes your files that are in your file system, it must be, it could be a POSIX file system, could be Ceph, could be Luster, and serves them over the network. And then you can use this protocol to, to access uh, the files. Uh, there is also a way of preloading a library that uh, replaces the, the standard POSIX calls and allows uh, standard software to use uh, the root protocol to access data. And it also has a built-in uh, clustering support. So there's a second daemon. So the XRD daemon does the data access part. And there is a CMSD cluster management system daemon that does the clustering. And uh, it supports uh, having 64 nodes. So the top node is usually called the manager. Underneath you can have 64 interior nodes. These are supervisors. And at the end of the leaf you have the data servers. And this is used to create a uniform namespace so the, the job of managing this namespace coherently is on, on the user, but if you communicate always, so from the external uh, side, everything looks like you have a single system, um, but it can also be used for load balancing and scaling situations that all the servers are similar. For example, if you're serving data that is actually in Ceph, you can mount Ceph or use, use a 3D Ceph plugin to serve this data over the network. Um, uh, while looking like it's, um, uh, sorry, so you, you can have the authentication and serve the data over the network while the actual storage is uh, managed by Ceph. Uh, this is uh, actually widely deployed across uh, high energy physics and other, other areas of science. Uh, the biggest example is CMS, they have the so-called triple A federation, any data, anytime, anywhere. Uh, so this is a, a distribution of sites mostly across the United States. Um, the Open Science Grid also uses uh, XRD to distribute data from various uh, institutions in an easy to access way and they use mostly HTTP support from, from XROOT and in the worldwide LCG computing grid, the WLCG, it's also used extensively. And it has a highly adaptable plugin architecture uh, so if you can write a plugin for it, you can cluster it. And the um, example I put here is the best example of not for file systems only is uh, the Vera Rubin uh, Observatory uses this to make a big cluster of a petabyte scale MySQL by uh, using X3D clustering combined with processing the SQL requests, distributing them under the cluster and then merging all the results and uh, processing them. And the project, uh, lastly, has extensive support for monitoring. So all this data that I'm showing to you from Grafana is coming from this monitoring stream from XRT. EOS, which is uh, this distributed file system, is built on top of XRT. So XRT provides the framework, the, the protocol, request redirections, third-party copy support, which is something quite specific to our community. So you have this data management middleware where you have a policy of how many copies of the data, where it should be, um, um, that communicates this to another software that tells the storages to move the data. So the, the software itself doesn't do the, the, the movement, it does a third party copy by inst instructing other storages to do it. And it started in 2010 to solve the physics analysis case for the LHC. It's a very effect, a cost effective system. So on average, we've made the calculation. It costs less than uh, one Swiss franc per terabyte per month. If you look over the long term for er erasure coded storage. And it's an efficient way for sharing resources with thousands of users. So there's like over 30,000 users that have accounts at CERN. Uh, that need to access the storage. So uh, as long as they can have a certificate from the um, from the grid authority, they can get access to, to access this. And there are ACLs, like there are sorts of groups uh, 
um, it's like an LDAP system where you can create groups, add people, and then share, apply this ACL on the file system and share data with other people. Uh, and something quite essential for the experiments is this quality of service features. You don't want a user overloading the system when the experiments uh, are trying to save data. Uh, so this is used uh, across all the, the, the sites, more than 150 of them. And the Fuse is the thing that provides a convenient interface for the users. For certain box in particular, for the user directories and projects that are not physics experiments, there is integration with own cloud web interface. And then this allows people to have like a client on the phone. They can use via Samba and access via Windows. And they have, there is a sync and, sync and share client where they can save the data. The architecture is quite different than X, like vanilla XRD. Uh, there is namespace server. Usually we run three of them for redundancy. The, there is a main one that has the, the persistency for the namespace. And there are two followers that repeat all the, the operations. And this is uh, done with something called QuarkDB, which is a layer on top of RocksDB. And this is developed at CERN and uses the Redis protocol. And this runs as a separate process to the namespace server itself. And the namespace is actually cached in memory, so then to have uh, lower latency. The storage servers, they're like what I've shown uh, before. They have uh, usually 48 to 120 disks. They're just based on JBODs. We want the cheapest possible kind of storage. Um, and to scale up the performance of the namespace so across all the instances, we have many instances. So there are 24 different instances. Each experiment, uh, each large experiment gets their own instance of, uh, so own version of this infrastructure with the three namespace servers, 100 or so uh, storage nodes. And there is a smaller uh, called EOS public uh, instance that holds data for smaller experiments, certain open data. I'm, I'm the service manager for this instance. And then we have a use user, use project. So on the namespace, when you mount everything with Fuse, it just looks like you're browsing directories, but everything is there um, at CERN. And the features that are needed by experiments, I, I put this uh, example here. So you, sometimes you have users that they don't really know the impact on the system of what they're doing. So they submit a physics analysis job and they just want to list a directory. So they send a 5,000 jobs listing a director that has a million files, so they have 5 billion entries to receive to do their job. And then the poor guy trying to list the directory, his own directory, there are three files, uh, would have to wait. So the, the system has some self-protection to throttle down the rate of uh, metadata operations or bandwidth per user or group so that uh, they cannot disrupt what the experiments are trying to do in production. So the experiments have the priority. And there's also limits on the number of threads that they can use because you can create with a client, you can create many connections on the namespace server and that can overload the server as well. So there, there is a global limit on the number of threads and the, how many file descriptors the, the server can use. And also something important for the experiments is file placement policies. So you can choose one, the layout of the data but also if it goes on hard disks or SSDs, if the instance is hybrid, or how to balance them across the instance. So if you have 100 nodes, you don't have all the pieces of one file that is erasure code landing on the same node, because if that node goes down, you cannot read the file. So the, the, the choice of which nodes the pieces go to, um, there are several strategies to place them. And of course, that um, if you add new hardware, then some disks may be full. So you may want to rebalance this. So copy files across the instance so that you balance not the, um, so that you can balance the free space so that when you, the experiment wants to take data and write really fast, there is enough space on all the disks so that you can get better performance to write the data. And there are also conversion and cleanup policies. For example, if some data area is being used for staging data that is going to tape, then after you can set a policy to clean up the files. And maybe you want to convert files that are bigger than a certain amount to erasure coding layouts so that you can save some space. So in terms of a Fuse client, the, the origins are with the XRD's own Fuse client, which is much simpler and not as robust as the use client. So a lot of time has been invested to make the client good enough to use in production. So it started around the same time as EOS. And in the beginning, it was based on the path. 
and later on it will switch to use inode instead of path because of consistency if you have clients accessing the system from everywhere it's not very easy to keep everything uh, consistent so on average there are 30,000 active clients connected to the instances at any given time um, it's mostly based on libfuse2 all the clients that are in production now uh, the the clients that are newer based on libfuse3 they're mostly used with assemble gateways to support windows users and uh, there were some issues in the past with uh, notification mechanisms uh, invalidation lookup forgetting of inodes uh, so this would cause project processes to go in this state and then lock the mount uh, and then the you know the the, the batch uh, machine had to be um, reset and so on underneath the 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 fuse mount the fuse client it, it's a bit uh, inverted to what normally the fuse is thought so this would be the fuse serve and fuse terminology but we think of it more as the client because it's the thing that is connecting to the main names per server and getting data from there so we think of it as a fuse client uh, it uses the xrd protocol so even that 18 percent uh, exabyte uh, it uses the fuse layer but it goes uh, still over the xrd protocol over the network um, and the um, operations that the clients do they are broadcast so they reach the namespace server and then uh, the namespace has all the other clients connected and it broadcasts the information so if somebody renames a file all the other clients get this information but there is a limit so if if there are too many clients connected this is not happening and then it, we use the uh, eventual consistency so when the client connects back to the namespace server then we'll get the updated information and uh, there's also a little bit of uh, let's say smartness in the client to not just send every single write over the network so there is a little journal that is local to the to each of the clients and then once you have enough to send over the network it's sent and the first 256k of each file is cached um, some of the problems that we've hit uh, in the past is uh, this uh, inode invalidation that uh, is suppressed when the write back cache is enabled in the kernel and this causes for example if a file changes the size uh, then the client doesn't get the information because the cache thinks that it has the, the, the latest information so I, I link here to the, the ticket where this is discussed my office mate uh, created it and then when we migrated to Alma 9, we saw also some problems. I don't think this is a fault of the kernel, it's usually our own fault, that sometimes the um, uh, mount got uh, stale or got like an idle timeout, and then that froze the mount, and then got mounted again on top, and this created some problems in the batch system. But these things, they have been uh, fixed in the latest versions of EOS. Uh, in terms of areas of interest and ideas for, for new features, um, so physics analysis makes very heavy use of uh, vector reads and fuse breaks them into individual reads and then sends them over the network and then that penalizes um, so then um, I actually implemented a hook in root that when it reads in, when it's reading a file that is on EOS EOS actually has several dynamic uh, file attributes that you can query and one of them gives you the URL you can use to connect to that file over the XRD protocol so when somebody is doing physics analysis, even if they use the path from the fuse mount, you, the, the root software will just query this attribute and then try to reopen the file using the network via XRT because root itself has an implementation using our client library that has some internal caching and, and other uh, smarter things, let's say, and then the, the gets better performance that way and then this is a point made by my colleague that the architecture in which uh, if there was an architecture in which the metadata caches uh, like file attributes and so on could be shared between kernel and user space then our fuse client could benefit a lot from that um, in general fuse performance is not a problem for us the, um, the most of the bottlenecks they're all either on the namespace or on the on the client so it has been working uh, quite well and we're now exploring some ideas there is a prototype called EOCFS D client file system daemon and this is just an idea to add for example just take uh, 
thin layer of a pass-through file system, and let's say that you want to have Ceph, but you want to have Kerberos authentication on top. Then you have this thin layer where the client takes care of the mount and then exposes something outside that requires the Kerberos authentication. Uh, and here is just a picture of uh, the 30,000 clients that I mentioned in the other slides. Sometimes we have some somebody submitting something and then you have a spike in the number of uh, uh, clients that are connected. Um, so lastly, I wanted to just mention the project. I don't work w uh, with uh, CVMFS myself. Uh, this is actually developed, the, the CVMFS is developed in the experimental physics department for historical reasons, but our group actually does run uh, the instances of CVMFS and Fabrizio Furano, who was uh, one of the stars of X3D, uh, is the service manager for this. Uh, CVMFS is what we use to distribute the software uh, across the grid to run the analysis jobs. It's a Fuse uh, file system based on HTTP and it's read-only, so you have to publish the updates to some uh, strat so-called Stratum Zero server and then from there it gets propagated over CDN and then the clients, uh, they, they read uh, from the, either the S3 backend or whatever uh, CDN you're using to distribute the, the files in, over HTTP. So it was developed to decouple the experiment software from the base OS. And the, this was a solution to be able to distribute a terabyte worth of nightly builds uh, across the grid so that next day people can submit a job to the batch system and nobody has to install the software there uh, by hand. So it gets published to CVMFS and everybody can read over HTTP, download the new software and, and just run it. Uh, the namespace is stored in uh, SQLite and it uh, has content address uh, storage because then you can do data deduplication. So if you have the same package installed on, on a few distros or if different packages have files with the same contents, then this gets deduplicated. And more recently, it's also being used uh, to unpack uh, container images that you can then use, for example, Singularity to run. And uh, the startup is reduced by a lot because when you start, you only download the files that you actually need. And then when you run, you only download the parts of the image that you actually need to, to your local machine. Uh, instead of downloading the entire image. And also it's being used uh, for software distribution HPCs. Uh, so I am actually a Gen2 developer since uh, some time. And when I learned about CVMFS, I said, okay, this is the perfect uh, combination with Gen2 prefix. Gen2 prefix is how I got actually into Gen2. I had a Mac and I was installing Gen2 software in it. It just allows you to install uh, software in a prefix other than slash user. And on macOS, you have to use the libc of the OS, but on Linux, you can actually just take the kernel and install glibc and everything else in there. And then when you do this with CVMFS, you have something that is there as a network file system and it works on any Linux distribution. So uh, I presented this a uh, while ago in 2017, I think, in one of our high energy physics conferences. And then the Compute Canada uh, liked the idea. They started working on it. They were using Nix. They replaced with Gen2 prefix. And then they use easy build to like build a more familiar environment with these modules that are using HPC. And then uh, easy took this idea much further. Um, I, I think you should really check them out. Um, I hope that this becomes like a standard way of distributing software and HPCs. And um, just the uh, last uh, thing, just to give you a big picture of the storage landscape uh, that we have at CERN. So X3D sits at the bottom of EOS, and then on top you have uh, all sorts of things. You have CERN box, which is for users. It's also integrated with uh, web applications. For physics analysis, you have root. There is Swan, which is a web interface, like Jupyter Notebooks combined with root, where you can submit your jobs to the batch from that interface. There is CERN Open Data and the CERN Document Server that also use, uh, they serve data using the Fuse mount. Uh, then they have this web application on top. Uh, Rusian FTS are this middleware that manages the, the data movements. 
and we use also a lot of Ceph. I'm not part of the, the, the team that deals with, uh, with this, but with the Ceph S3, we provide the storage for CVMFS, and then um, we also use RBD to provide the storage for AFS, which is still used. Uh, we're trying to phase it out, but it refuses to die. And uh, CephFS is also used as same. So we use uh, all the, the three different ways. And finally, just uh, leaving some pointers to our projects. They're all open source. Um, we're reachable on GitHub. Uh, some of the projects are on GitLab. And we had recent events for about XRoot D, EOS, and CVMFS. So all this year. So if you're interested in how uh, scientific institutions and other users are using these projects, uh, I recommend to have a look. Um, we have many interesting use cases. I just realized that uh, one of the sponsors of the conference, Jump Trading, they actually use CVMFS to distribute data across their cluster to do like a data analysis for a trading for their trading systems. So, and that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, so, on the EOS systems, the 100 gigabit network, is that InfiniBand? Is that Ethernet? That is Ethernet. Okay. And, and by the way, I, I work for Jump Trading, and we're very thankful for uh, CVMFS. Ah, thank you. <laughs> nice to hear. Thank you. Um, do you take the relatively close placement? I mean, I, I guess most of the nodes are uh, not in a, not in a very uh, distributed uh, area. Mm -hmm. uh, is it a strong assumption to have the performance? Uh, not necessarily the performance. What we want to avoid, for example, if a switch goes down, maybe that's what you're thinking. If a switch goes down and then two replicas of a file are there, then the file is down. We want to avoid this, so the, the, there is a tag that tells uh, EOS where in the data center the machine is. And then you try to tag machines that are on different sub-networks, so that even if a switch goes down, nobody loses access to their files. I don't know if that answers the question. No, my question was more related to the physical distance of the nodes uh, between themselves. Are they all located in the same data center, for example? Yes, uh, so the, um, I removed the slides because I thought I wouldn't have time. So the WLCG, the Worldwide LHC Computing Grid, it, it consists of several tiers. Tier zero is CERN. So the batch system that I showed and EOS, they're on the same building. And now there is a new data center that is built in Previsan site. So if I go back to the beginning, so there is, there is a data center that is here, and the, the other data centers, the, the tier zero is around here. So uh, we will move some uh, data there for redundancy. So this is mostly for the home directories and, and other things. Um, but, sorry. <laughs> what did I want to explain again? So the at least for EOS and the batch system, everything's in the same building, so there's no okay. big deal in performance. For, for people that are in the US, then it's different, because then you're very far away, and that's when this federation from CMS comes in, because then they have this data f with XRT that they can take an origin that is in the US and then use uh, the XRT server configured as a cache so that it does the first read, there is a penalty, but then when you read again, then uh, yeah. things go okay. quite fast. But in terms of performance of the network, uh, I don't think there are any bottlenecks at the moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks. Do you have uh, a way to get the, the statistics for the files access, random, size of the files, big, small, uh, and pattern of access? Um, Yes, so there is, um, for the pattern of access, uh, 
we, we don't have a general monitoring of, of everything. So you can have some information, so you can turn on things very detailed in X4D that would give you this information, but it's too much. Usually it's not turned on. Uh, there is also a, a client-side plugin on X4D that you can use, for example, how do we know that we have all these vector reads? You can load the plugin in the client that will record all the, the operations, and then at the end it will give you a summary, how, much, how many reads you did, how many read Vs, and then the sizes and so on, and then you can analyze this. So the uh, advantage of using this is that you read only the parts of the file that you need for your analysis. For example, if you're filtering on the energy of a particle, you don't want to read uh, all the other parts of the data. And then once you filter, then you know what you want to read for the rest, then, then you read the rest. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, uh, not really a software question. Uh, do you, by any chance, publish your uh, disk statistics about uh, failure, that kind of stuff, like uh, Backblaze does? Do I don't you? think it's published anywhere. Uh, that might be an interesting thing to do. I, I don't know if the vendors, they would like to give this information. But when you have, so there are now, if you sum up all the disks that I showed in the plot, plus the disks for Ceph and, and everything, there are about 100,000 disks in total. And the failure rate probably is around 0.1%, but even mm. something like this, every week you have a couple of disks mm. that are failing and somebody needs to go there and replace them. And of course that EOS needs to be able to cope with this and change, like change uh, hardware that breaks on the fly without affecting the service. Um, what, uh, there are using in terms of features in EOS is that once you realize that a hard a drive is giving errors, uh, there is a trigger to drain the drive, which means just make another copy of all the data on that drive somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So that if you have two copies, by the time you remove this disk, there are still two copies, and then you don't uh, lose any data. Mm -hmm. um, occasionally, we're unlucky enough that two disks at the same time break, each of a copy will have each with a copy of a file, and then this file can be lost, but uh, there is usually a copy at CERN of data and another copy somewhere else. When this rare thing occurs, very often they can just send a copy back from one of the tier one sites, for example, or just re recall it from tape. Have you upstreamed your changes to the kernel vanilla? Could um, you, have you taken any opportunity to stream up, to give up back your patches? I don't think we have any patches directly at the kernel. We just use the standard distribution kernels in our systems. Okay, thanks. There are no more questions. Thank you very much.